This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 420, recorded on December 16th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free. If you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here at New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Where it's, it's gotten very, really cold. I was going to say, it's very cold outside. Last couple of uh, mornings, minus two Celsius at the moment. The Arctic zephyr. According to this, Dixon, yes. we're supposed to get 13 centimeters tomorrow of snow. Right. That's right. And then it's going to turn to rain. Do you know about that? I yeah, did. Sunday's supposed I to did. rain. I, I knew about that. Hmm. The hydrological cycle is alive and well, except that it's just been delayed this year. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. We have you beat. It's minus 11 Celsius. <laughs> you can, you can win this one. It's okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you have snow and on the ground, our, Kathy? Our wintry mix is starting uh, maybe by the end of the podcast right. until noon tomorrow. Oh, it's going to be yucky. You're going to have, you're going to have an accumulation of snow. Uh, active weather alert: uh, <laughs> uh, three to six inches. Right, that's what we've got. But it's wintry mix, freezing rain Saturday morning, mm-hmm. resulting in a light glaze. Only resulting in a light glaze. Just enough to drive you crazy, and that's yeah. uh, meant literally. <laughs> yes. Yes. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How you doing? How's your snow alert or going? Should I say howdy? Uh, <laughs> we got no snow. We got no snow alert. We got 64 degrees Fahrenheit oh. and uh, cloudy. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's okay. I, my, my converter is not working here, but that must be on the order of what? 17 or 18 C something like that. Mm-hmm. 61 is 16, right? Kathy. Right. And we're at 64. So that's, that's going to be 17 yeah. or 18 no, today, something like that. It's palindrome. Uh, so, it's all good. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is um, brutally cold. It's, <laughs> uh, it's now Well, now it's up to 21 Fahrenheit minus 6C, so not as cold as it is uh, in Michigan, but... Uh, we had. I'm surprised nobody's commented on the wind up here. It was gusting to 50 knots last night. That's incredible. Um, yeah, yesterday it was windy here, and and I didn't know if we would be able to record today because it whistles through the windows. That's true. right. I remember that. Remember? <laughs> yeah. That's it. Today it's pretty good. You did Dixon. that pretty well, Vincent. I, I like that. Sound That's effect. it's what I can do, Dixon. <laughs> yeah. That's what I can do. And on demand. <laughs> on demand. You want, Probably you? drove a few listeners crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and a few dogs too, by the way. But dogs like whistles. High pitch, though. Higher than Yes, they can hear in a higher frequency right. range than us. Right. Kathy, you uh, have something to tell us about ASV? Oh, yes, I do. So this would be a really good time to get your membership to ASV. If you're planning on attending the meeting in June of 2017 in Madison, Wisconsin, at the Monona Terrace, the dates are June 24th to 28th, and abstracts are due February 1st, but if you're going to submit an abstract and have it be sponsored by a full dues paid up member, that person should either uh, pay up their their dues or uh, get a membership. And if you're a student or postdoc or a Latin American scholar or a teacher of undergraduate virology and you want to apply for one of those travel grants, you need to be a member of the ASV and those travel grants are due February 1st. So while you're contemplating what you're going to put in your abstract, you should get your membership up to speed. Mm. There you go. And I just wanted to point out that this year there are five satellite symposia on the Saturday before the main meeting, including one that's a career planning workshop for junior virologists. 
this particular satellite is free, but it's limited to the first 100 students and postdocs who sign up for it. So you should register now if you're interested in attending that. Sounds like it's going to be a really good career planning workshop. Is so that where the one you Glenn, Ra- Glenn Rawl is running? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You're part of it, speak. right? I'm yep. part of it. And Madison yep. at that time of the year should be absolutely beautiful. Oh yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. So the website is asv.org. Then over to the right, you click on annual meeting, and then you click on annual meeting again. And then when you get to the University of Wisconsin Monona Terrace site, you probably want to bookmark that so that you can go back and forth to it easily. So asv.org is where you start. I have to get this done. Yeah, I got my plane reservations. I got my hotel booked. I'm ready. I got my wow. Uh, sim- I'm, wow. I'm going to the evolution uh, pre th- pre thing satellite. Satellite. Mm-hmm. Dixon, you want to go? Um, oh, yeah, in you, June, forget sure. It, forget it. No, You're no. too slow at answering. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow virus. What can I tell you? <laughs> if you want, we could, but you can't cancel this time. No, I think I, the audience would love to see you. I, I, I could. I, I could squeeze that into my busy oh, yeah. schedule. Oh, yeah. Squeeze it. <laughs> the, only thing is, the only thing is, I don't, I don't want to have to make you register, even though we would pay for it. It's still a lot of money. Well, so, how much is it? It's 600 bucks, I think, right? That's right, a, Kathy? Early, a, early register. But we, we new would. Winston fly rod. Yeah, I know. So we, we have to do something <laughs> about this with TWIV guests, uh-huh. you know, because um, they're not going to stay for that. Well, Alan, you might stay for the whole meeting, right? I'll, I'm going to probably stay for at least some of the meeting. I, I would hope to stay for the whole meeting, but I'm going to see how my schedule works right. out. Well, well, I'm going to have to take this up with the uh, the, the management. <laughs> right. But I, I would be uh, enthusiastic to attend. Yeah, that would how be fun. The whole, the whole crew. That would be fun. Yeah. I yeah. could even wear my TWIV uh, sweatshirt. Yeah, you could do that. All right. We have a bunch of follow-up. Now, first one is, is comes from Twitter from someone with the handle Virosphere2012, and that's Curtis Suttle, who says, for the record, Matt Fisher was my PhD student, where he was introduced to Cafeteria Roenbergensis virus. So I thought he might be a postdoc, have been a postdoc with him, but no, I was wrong. Okay, and I'm glad cool. that okay. Curtis, I'm glad that Curtis listens to uh, Twiv. <clears throat> also from Rob. I wanted to follow up on last week's letter from Katreya on viruses that induce epigenetic changes in the host genome. There is now quite a body of work that suggests virus genes can directly manipulate the epigenetic landscape of the host genome. Mm. In the case of Epstein-Barr virus, the EBNA2 protein can drive histone acetylation to activate genes, while the EBNA3 proteins can induce repressive histone methylation. This is done to promote cellular proliferation and avoid cell death, amongst many other things. In addition, work from the West Lab at the University of Sussex, UK, has shown that these proteins can both disrupt and induce the formation of long-range enhancer-promoter interactions, thereby altering the 3D structure of genes. provides a reference for that. Also, work from the all-day lab here at Imperial suggests that EBNA3-induced epigenetic repression can be fixed as heterable DNA methylation in EBV-positive Burkitt lymphomas, despite the fact that the EBNA3 proteins are no longer produced in this lymphoma, a process of hit-and-run oncogenesis, if you will. For more detail, you can check out our review on the EBNA3 proteins, normally paywalled but downloadable free from our website, ebv.org.uk. And for some examples from other viruses, see this paper. Cheers, Rob. P.S., for what it's worth, I would definitely attend a virologically-themed board game session at ASV (laughs) if I make it across the pond next year. Cool. Rob White is a lecturer in virology at Imperial College London. I figured we'd get an answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. A good Mm -hmm. question from Ketreya. Yep. Um, All right, let me take just the next one because it's dealing with my error Dave writes, Vincent and the gang. (laughs) While your knowledge of viruses is impressive, your knowledge of North American birds needs some literacy. (laughs) That's a nice way to put that. Yeah, you think so? Yeah, it's a a gentle way of saying you were wrong. Far from being an introduced species, there are over 35 native sparrow species in North America and gives a link to that. As an avid bird watcher and, like Dixon, an avid fly fisherman, 
They are some of my favorite birds. Mm -hmm. But Alan, while being wrong about sparrows, you are right about starlings. They are an introduced well, okay. species. <laughs> I enjoy your podcast immensely, though Though my thesis was on anarchism and the Russian Revolution. <laughs> Tuivo is also a favorite, being eclectic in its mixing of disciplines, and he signs it, Run with the Hunted. Nice. Okay. okay. I actually meant to say the English sparrow yes. was yes. important. Yes, 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 yes. So I, the, the, what my mistake was, was not to consult... The original source when I uh -huh. spoke, so therefore I misspoke, and that led me to go back to the original source, which is the Beak of the Finch by Jonathan Weiner or Weiner. And I would like to read a couple of paragraphs because it's lovely. It just shows you how cool the writing is. Mm -hmm. And this is a quote: Bumpus was teaching biology at Brown University. His path to work each morning led up College Hill and past the Providence Athenaeum, one of the oldest libraries in the United States. The morning after the storm, as he made his way through the snow, he happened to notice a large number of English sparrows lying dead or exhausted in the drifts beneath the Athenaeum. The sparrows had been wintering in the ivy that covered the library, and the gale had overwhelmed them. These sparrows were newcomers to New England, as Bumpus knew, old world birds in the New World. One of the first pairs had been released in New York's Central Park in 1851, the decade before Bumpus was born by an eccentric bird lover who wanted to import every one of the birds in Shakespeare's plays <laughs> to the United States. So the yes. birds were lying in the snow that morning, in part because Shakespeare had written, there is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. Mm. So it turns out he collects these birds, brings them back to the lab. Uh, 72 of them survived. 64 died. He recorded the sex, body length, wingspans, and weight of both living and dead, he also measured the length of the head, the humerus, the femur, the tibiotarsus, the skull, and the sternum. When he tabulated all these results, he found that most of the survivors were males, and among the males, the survivors tended to be shorter and lighter than average with longer wind bones, longer legs, longer sternums, and greater brain capacity. Is that lovely writing? Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very nice. Absolutely. And um, I believe I was just Googling this. Um, uh, Eugene Shifflin, uh, Shifflin was the uh, eccentric who was um, part of the New York Zoological Society. He introduced starlings and I think <laughs> was responsible for introducing um, the sparrows as well. Nice. Yes. Yeah, he wanted to introduce all the birds mentioned in the plays of William Shakespeare. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> and I thought... And it's not mentioned here, but I thought he was also responsible for swans, which are, which are another, the European swan, which was hmm. imported, uh, or someone like him did that to us. I, I think I'd like to introduce all the viruses in <laughs> Pick Your Book. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's already been done. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Dixon, can you read Steve's email? Sure. Just a quick follow-up note following your discussion of sparrows in response to your correspondence. Dixon, talking about the Chinese catching all their sparrows as pests, might have missed part of the motive. He reminded me that I had heard about China and massive numbers of sparrows before. Usually we hear of the world's vanishing wildlife disappearing into China, but this was a real example of reversal of flow of staggering proportions. The wonders of Google instantly took me to the new scientist of December 1993, where European ornithologists were shocked when a shipment of over 2 million frozen tree sparrows were discovered in Rotterdam en route from China. This number is particularly astonishing to us in the UK because our tree sparrows are on the way to becoming extinct. So 2 million in one shipment was unthinkable. I would think that if flu virus were recovered from the bodies in, a perm in permafrost, a shipment of an entire population of sparrows frozen and transported around the globe would spread avian viruses quite effectively, though actually getting to breathe them in would, of course, be difficult. I never did hear anything more about the sparrow trade with China again until your podcast reminded me. I hope it was stopped. Another fascinating program. Keep them coming. All the best, Steve. Typically dull, gray December, weather in my new vitamin D calculating app tells me it will be impossible to get any form of sunlight here until the end of February. Mm -hmm. so there's <laughs> an app that tells you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, I, so, Dixon, yeah. you're, you listened to me last time. I did. And you did not read what's in a square bracket. Did you do that on purpose or did you just 
flick it over. Oh, no, he's right on top of it. Dixon is hey, all over this. You know, sometimes I'm cooking right on all on cylinders, and sometimes I ain't, and today is one of those <laughs> days. So everything fact, is... <laughs> so Steve had put those square brackets in, not uh-huh. me. But no, that's I did. Funny. Did you? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. But it's once, not purple. Once I clicked on the link. No, I didn't make it purple. So you fooled but, us all. Yeah. You know, Kathy, I've been trying to look for a, col- a color that I could make mine, but it just... There's nothing like that purple. That purple is one. You know, I might have an earlier version of this show because I don't have that on my screen. Oh. Well, there's, oh. Some now, pretty, there's some pretty intense ones, Rich. You could yeah. pick pink or... I'll tell you, you know. Dixon, hit the refresh button. Do you know what that is? It's somewhere. <laughs> well, no. while you're looking for it, I think Rich should take the next one. <laughs> I'm. Uh, just, let's just back up a moment. Yes. This, um, this new scientist story does not explain why somebody ordered two million no, tree sparrows. It right, not. it does not. There is these some. Are, mention, these are little birds. Mention. There's not a lot of good eating on them. Correct. I don't think. That's why you need two million of them. Well, they're right. the avian equivalent of a sardine. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> they could have been being sent to Italy and mistakenly delivered to the United States because they that's, eat some. That's a lot of plucking. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was wondering exactly the same thing, Alan. I also wondered whether. You know, maybe the feathers might be useful for something. I don't know. So this uh, it's eight times the British breeding population. Right. But I think somewhere <laughs> in that article, they, they make at least a passing reference to food. Ah, right. Yeah. Right. They say all but, the, all but the sparrows are for pets. But, yeah, um, yeah they did go to food markets. Mm. That's they, weird. They included birds of prey that are protected under Chinese law. Amazing. Well, yeah, it's very interesting. I wonder what happened to the two million birds. Huh. All right, uh, Rich Condit, please. Anthony writes, perhaps Dr. Condit might wish to check out this Austin pizzeria. Uh, it's Hoboken Pie. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear how it compares to Satchel's. I have some comment on this. Uh, with a pigeon as a logo, Hoboken Pie ought to be good. If indeed it does make the grade, a short walk from the Congress Street Bridge, maybe a twiv on the road could be recorded there. <laughs> and Emo's Music Club is in the neighborhood too. With a little luck, you might catch the Black Angels, the I-35 incarnation of the Velvet Underground, for what it's worth. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I really appreciate all of these people writing in and in one <laughs> fashion or another kind of uh, uh, welcoming me to Austin. I really appreciate that. And I put uh, Hobo, I've started a list of restaurants because I'm getting recommendations all the time. And I put Hobo Can Pie on the list. And I have um, <laughs> news of Satchel's. They had another fire. Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, the restaurant is okay, but uh, Lightning Salvage. Uh, which was the junk store bar uh, music place in the back was destroyed. Oh. Mm. Um, he will rebuild. Uh, you know, uh, Satchel is irrepressible. Uh, <laughs> I must say <laughs> that Lightning Salvage, I remember standing in there with you, Dixon. You do. Okay. And I remember standing, standing in there, there with you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Drinking a beer and looking at all the crazy stuff. Yeah, hanging that's all right. Place. I'll tell you, that was a fire waiting to happen, that place. <laughs> it could go up really like a torch. But at, it's really, really sad news, but I'm sure yeah. they'll do just fine. Uh, I will check out Hoboken Pie. It's going to be, uh, you know, you know, pizzas, I guess there's ordinary pizza, and then there <laughs> are unique pizzas. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's hard to compare anything to Satchel's. Uh, from the looks of it, Hoboken will have its own character. This one looks like it has pear slices on it. If you look in the middle of the pizza, right? There's some. Oh. I think that's why there's the pears in the foreground. I, you know, this is the, <laughs> that that comes under the heading of frou frou pizza, and it's not not yeah. in my. You got I'm it. not in the frou frou pizza. Yeah. That's right. My you brother know? has a rule: I, no, no. No fruit, no bait. <laughs> this is fruit, fruit pizza, not frou frou pizza. I tell Excuse you, me. Here it is: <laughs> sausage, pepperoni, onions, green peppers, garlic, mushrooms, and jalapenos. That'll do. That's it. pizza. That's a pizza. Don't forget the tomato sauce, though, Rich. Come on, you have oh, to have yeah. a base yeah. for I mean, that, that's, and then that's mozzarella that's cheese. Tomato sauce. Yeah, sure. Of course. That's the that's the that's just, a margarita that's plus back. a margarita plus. That's what that is. So, Rich, you have not been here, right? I have not been there yet. Okay. And now, I will report uh, By the way, Hoboken pie is not a popular item here either. It's probably just 
popular in Hoboken. Well, it's the name of the place. Yeah, I understand that, but I, I don't know of any pizza. In fact, pie. if you go to the site, it says, you know, inspired by New Jersey. Ha. Huh. Okay. <laughs> and then, then further, uh, Anthony, I happen to know, is from Jersey City, which is next to Hoboken, and he knows Hoboken. He's written in a bunch about it. Right. Well, Anthony, maybe I'll see you there. Uh-huh. Let's lunch. Hey. You won't, because he's you know not what? in Austin. <laughs> He's not in Austin. No, no, he's in Jersey City. Oh, he's in Jersey. I he's thought Jersey. maybe he was in Austin. Okay. No, but he found it. I don't know why. Maybe he knows Austin. And, well, uh, he uh, he clearly does because he's to. talking about Conger Street Bridge and uh, Emo's Music Club. That's why I assumed he was from Austin. He must have spent some time here. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Something's going on in Austin recently. I forgot what it is. I think oh, there's something probably. always going on in Austin. Yes. There's, there's a it's city like limits. Michael Reed. I arrived here. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's and, big, that's uh, the big thing. And, uh, they had Andrew to readjust Wakefield. the signs on the outside of Austin saying population, and then they had to cross that out and put in another number. Right. All right. Just a little bit of Zika update. Uh, there, um, there's been a little local transmission in Texas. Speaking of Texas. In Cameron County, which is near the border, mm. right, on the border. And it's about as south, far south in Texas as you can, you can get. Possibly, it's that little tip that sticks down there. Yeah. Is that near Big Bend Park? No, that's. I forget. I thought Big Bend was north of here. I'd have to look that up. Oh no, I think it's down on the Rio Grande. Yeah, yeah. but I think Big Bend is maybe further west. Okay, we'll figure I it just out. Asked anyway. No. So I have a link to the Texas Department of Health site, but then I found a better link called texaszika.org right <laughs> they bought a url it's just for zika in texas Lord. which is put out by the department of state health services hmm. but i think that's a great idea every state that yeah. uh, it should be florida zika.org etc and the group in galveston must be on this like uh, white on rice as they would say anyway there was uh, a first case back on november 28th which i'd heard about in the rio grande valley and then uh a few more more recently, additional local cases in Cameron County. So these are spread locally by uh, mosquitoes biting people and and then getting sick, and then the mosquito goes to someone else. But not, these not are too the many. genuine Aedes aegypti. Genuine? Yeah. As opposed to the, the Albopictus. fake ones? Yeah, no, the Albopictus. They were. Well, they don't. They have not been known to transmit no. uh, Zika, right. even though they can be, the virus will replicate in yeah. them. Have not been known to transmit them. So what do we have here? Five cases mm. in Texas. Not a lot. Um, there are a lot of imported cases in Texas, of course, mm. uh, by uh, 274 as of December 9th. And I just wanted to point out that just like in Florida, where where the local transmission is ended, by the way, uh, there has been previously dengue transmission in Florida, local transmission by yeah. 80s aegypti. There has also been local transmission of dengue in Texas right. as well along the border with Mexico. There's a lot of dengue in Mexico, of course, and I suppose it's easy to get in. Where What the origin is of uh, the Zika, though, we don't know because uh, it could come from elsewhere. Lots of other places have. Uh... There we go. There is... Um, Big Bend National Park. Yep. Uh-huh. And Kathy's right, it is west, but very much still on the border. And so uh-huh. uh, the the uh, Cameron County is, is further. Next image, east. yeah. Right, it's south. Got that it. Is the southern tip. This is the real tip, isn't it? Isn't it Corpus Christi? Oh. It's near. And Big Bend is in that little bend south on the that, west yeah. edge. Uh, mm-hmm. Browning. Is hmm. there. Have you been to Big Bend, Kathy? No, I'd like to though. It's a great it sounds place. Sounds like it's really beautiful. Yeah. 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 You know, there's a, a a writer and she she writes um kind of detective books. Each one is in a different national park. Really? Hmm. Oh. And one of them was in Big Bend. I'll be darned. And they're really quite interesting. Uh, I forgot her name. Hmm. Um, it's a good way to write off a long vacation. Exactly. <laughs> I think she's she's actually said that she's admitted. It. <laughs> All right. So, a little bit anyway, uh, transmission is stopped in Florida. Uh, a little local transmission in Texas, but no one expects that to continue very much. And not a lot of people live there to begin with, so you wouldn't expect too much to happen. However, Dixon, the CDC has issued a travel warning for Brownsville, oh, Texas. Brownsville, right. <laughs> so if you're pregnant, 
You should probably not go to Brownsville, Texas, oh, to which most people are saying, why the hell would I go there anyway? <laughs> but I don't mean to offend any listeners in Brownsville. Well, it's I'm, not I'm, a small town. It's a, it's a major port, large. apparently. How many large. people live there? A million people. Yeah. So we probably have a one TWIV listener there. Actually, I met somebody from Brownsville the other day. Uh, there one you of go. my uh, One of my son-in-law's uh, a, a co-worker. Mm-hmm. Okay. She said it was actually quite nice. It's right there on the Gulf Coast. That's right. I spent yep. all our time on the That's beach right. growing up. Yep. It's okay. also famous for having um, applied the concept of industrial ecology to piggybacking industries on, on in in front of and in back of other industries. That means that when one produces a byproduct that it can't use, another industry springs up that can use that byproduct and then continue to manufacture something different. They have 30 some odd uh, industries linked in that fashion in Brownsville. It's very mm-hmm. famous for that. Cool. Well, I must say there are plenty of cities of a million or more that I don't want to go to. <laughs> so it's not just a numbers game. Right. No offense to our TWIV listener in Brownsville. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you have a good pizza place, right? We're going to get mail. I bet you their fish and shrimp are good. We're going to hear from Brownsville. Nah. <laughs> well, I'm trying, to, I'm, trying to whip, I'm trying to whip up a little... Fury here. Little con- yeah. controversy. I don't think you want to tick off a bunch of Texans. No. No. <laughs> they, have a, they have a license plate that says, don't mess with Texas. Yeah. Well, mine says viruses, so they're not going to come near me because they're going to get infected if they do. What is do. New Jersey's license plate slogan? Help! The Garden State. The, the Garden, Garden State. State. It is the it. Garden State. That's right. Well, we used to call it the Garden Fate when we were in high school. Anyway, we have finally the last bit of Zika news is the paper from Scott Michael and Sharon Isern, which we, who we had on not too long ago, has finally been published in Clinical and Translational Immunology. Yay. Yes. Good. Dengue virus antibodies enhance Zika virus infection. Mm. This uh, is a long history because I first blogged about it when it came out on BioArchive. Gee, when, that must have been way back in March or April, something like that. And Mm -hmm. um, it was really the first enhancement paper out there, and then many others were published. Several others were published as they had troubles publishing theirs, and now it's out. So congratulations. And, you know, there are lots of undergrads on this paper, all undergrads besides Scott and Sharon. So that's cool. That's awesome. They must be very excited. So congratulations on that. Yes. All right, now we will move to uh, our paper, which was suggested last week— by Drake, he said, this is an interesting story. And I looked at it and I said, we have to do this because it looks pretty cool. And it is really interesting, I think. The approach is very unusual. It's a science paper called Generation of Influenza A Viruses as Live but Replication Incompetent Virus Vaccines. So I will, of course, do the obligatory objection to the use of live, but <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. And this comes out of uh, Beijing University. All right, so someone tell me. And the, um, the first author is Long Long C, and the uh, last author is Demin Zhao, just so we get that out of the way. Yeah, I, w- I was going to ask you to pronounce them all, actually. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. No? No. All right. I want to know why it's from Beijing, but the, the place is called Peking University. Didn't they change the name of the uh, university? I think they, not. Yeah, the historically it was Peking University, and right. I guess they've got that etched in stone in a bunch of places. And when the city changed its name to Beijing to more accurately reflect the mm-hmm. um, uh, the proper pronunciation, Peking University stayed Peking University. <laughs> right. It's interesting because the email of the corresponding author is bjmu.edu, right? Beijing right. Medical University. Okay. Anyway, all the authors, there are quite a few are from there. The whole idea here is to try and come up with a new way to make attenuated uh, infectious vaccines. You know, right now we're using most of the, all the ones that we have in, uh, in use at the moment, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, influenza, and others have been made empirically. Now, some engineered attenuated vaccines are on the horizon but like maybe a Zika virus uh, attenuated vaccine. But here, the approach is really unusual. So overall, here's the overall picture, Dixon. Yes. They introduced stop codons mm. into each, uh, uh, most of the uh, segments encoding the influenza virus protein. So influenza virus is the subject. Uh-huh. And of course, when you put a stop codon 
mm-hmm. in each, almost all segment sticks. And right. Do you think that virus would be able to replicate? No, because you can't translate past right. the stop codon. The stop. However, they devise a cell line that can suppress right. the stop codons, and that allows them to grow up the virus. Yeah. And then when it's it, when it's introduced into cells or in animals, it won't replicate, but it is immunogenic in amin- animals. Aminals. Aminals and aminals. <laughs> aminals. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the overall thing. It's pretty clever, right? Yeah. And I know this got Rich Condit all fired up. Oh. Yeah. Because you like suppression, seriously, and I love. Suppression. So, what is your a, what is your connection with suppression? Okay, so I'm going to give a little history and then my connection. Yep, uh, the, the, the I have the connection is uh, the history is part of the connection as well. So, first of all, uh, the, the the this comes out of the general rubric of nonsense suppression because stop codons are also called nonsense codons in the genetic code. There are three of them: UAA. UAG and UGA. And at those codons, there is, under normal circumstances, uh, no cognate amino acyl tRNA. Ribosomes see that, and they that tells them to cease translation. Um, sometime in the 60s, uh, uh, the, um, there was, a, according to this story, I was looking all over for the history. Oh, you know where it is. It's in uh, Phage and the Origins of Molecular Biology. Mm, right. Uh, there is. There were a couple of graduate students at Caltech that were part of the phage group that were uh, looking to see if they could find host range mutants of bacteriophage T4. They knew nothing about this translation or nonsense stuff. And they wound up isolating a um, strain of bacteriophage that would grow on one strain of E. coli uh, and not on another strain. Um, and it was subsequently discovered that uh, there were you could isolate all sorts of um, uh, strains of T4 that had the same sort of host range, but they were in all kinds of different genes. Um, and later it was discovered that the nature of these mutations was that they were uh, um, mutations of a coding codon to a nonsense codon, and the nature of the permissive strain, the one where these would grow, is that it had a mutant transfer RNA that now would base pair with a nonsense codon, and so would read it and stick in an amino acid, all right? And these were just enormously powerful tools, uh, ultimately, for uh, studying, doing genetics in bacteriophage. Uh, mostly, and to some extent in bacteria. And my run-in with these is I did my thesis on phage T7, and all the genetics consisted of a collection of uh, nonsense uh, mutants, mostly uh, amber mutants. That's the name of one of the particular codons, uh, the UGA, I guess. And um, Oh, UGA and, uh, is opal. Amber oh, UGA. is uh, UAG. UAG. Oh, okay, UAG. And... Um, it, uh, not only were they enormously useful, enormously powerful, but since uh, the, you create a truncated peptide, you could, with a mutant, correlate a protein on an acrylamide gel with mm. uh, the mutation because the protein from that gene got shorter. And, and that was just enormously cool. When I started doing pox virus genetics... I wished we could do this because if you could do nonsense suppression, that that you'd be able to engineer mutations in the virus. We had no way to engineer uh, conditionally lethal uh, mutants in the virus. You don't. There's no way you can know how to make a TS mutant. We came close, but it's uh, there's no really designer way to do that. But there was no nonsense uh, suppression system in eukaryotic cells. Uh, there were two labs that were working on it at one point or another. Um, actually, probably more than two, but the ones I was familiar with were Paul Berg and Phil Sharp. And in uh, the mid-80s, 1986, I went to Phil's lab where he was working on this to do a sabbatical there and try and uh, help uh, on a nonsense suppression system. There was one paper. They, they did develop a nonsense suppression system in eukaryotic cells, and there was one paper um, – uh, published on this, uh, where the first author is John Sedeby, last author is uh, Phil, where they actually made nonsense uh, mutants of polio virus. The problem is that the suppression really wasn't robust enough, and ultimately, I, 
use these cells. I made it. I made it actually a nonsense mutant in um, uh, in vaccinia uh, that uh, in beta galactosidase in vaccinia, so I could make blue plaques under the appropriate conditions. And I even had a lysate that I knew from southern blots had a nonsense mutation in the DNA polymerase that was. Uh, growing because it was uh, uh, there being helped by wild type virus, but I couldn't selectively plaque it out. My conclusion was that the suppression wasn't good enough. Mm. The biggest problem that is circumvented in this paper in a very clever fashion is that the suppressors in eukaryotic cells are toxic because they're sticking mm -hmm. uh, they're sticking amino acids into nonsense codons, and that's not right. good. All right. Um, Sedevi had a very clever way that I won't go into of, of uh, making an inducible suppressor, very clever way. Uh, but still, it was somewhat toxic. The cells got weird over time. Uh, and in the uh, long run, it didn't turn out to be useful. So this uh, paper, unfortunately, is 30 years too late for me. Uh, but it's a, an absolutely fascinating solution to that whole problem. You could come out of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Sound like you haven't come out yet <laughs> so uh, this um i just want to add a little coda here um before we go into the paper now uh, rich pasted a little uh, web page from stan malloy about how nonsense mutation got their names and basically uh a graduate student um harris bernstein was working on, on neurosper genetics so they coaxed him into looking at screening lots and lots of phage plaques to find uh suppressors and they said they would name the mutants after him. And his nickname was Immer Wieder Bernstein, Forever Amber in German. So they called them Amber Mutants when they first got them. Okay? So that the reason I'm telling you this is because the, the, the paper that um, Rich, the other paper Rich just mentioned from Phil Sharp's lab, where they suppressed an amber mutation in the poliovirus genome. If you look at that paper and you go to the end, they thank Harris Bernstein for for discussions, <laughs> but it's not the same Harris Bernstein That's because weird. he was he wasn't there anymore. When I went to the so Phil Sharp, so used you to know be, the other Harris Bernstein? I know the one who's thanked in the Sharp paper. Right, right. So when, okay. I, when I was at MIT, Phil Sharp was down the hall, uh, David Baltimore's mm -hmm. lab. Just before I was leaving, a new graduate student joined the lab, <laughs> and his name was Harris Bernstein. And he used to always joke that my nickname is Amber. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so he obviously went through college where everyone said, hey, did, did they name the codon after you? <laughs> and uh, it's exactly the same name. But I think it's so funny that here is a paper on Amber suppression right. named after Harris Bernstein. And Harris Bernstein is thanked because probably I had handed him the infectious polio clone when I left. And he probably helped them to, uh, to grow it up and make the mutations right. and so forth. A little bit of uh, behind the scenes, which I think is pretty cool. All right. So that was just, very exciting. I have, I have a comment, too, because when Rich said UGA, it was when I was at UGA <laughs> that I became very aware <laughs> of the yes. stop code on UGA. And I've been looking on my computer to see if I have an image of a, a sweatshirt. But I'll send yeah, you guys yeah. the image later that uh, makes use of that codon information so. you guys you guys big fans of slumdog millionaire the movie no, 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 no. I saw it. <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't see it. the answers to these questions sound as though well whatever the solution here is as as rich alluded to was to is to put a different suppressor system into eukaryotic cells and let's take another coda here let's they call it an orthogonal system an orthogonal orthogonal translation system is that and religious by nature? No, it's not okay, religious. So, no, that's not orthodox. This is um, <laughs> orthogonal. Orthogonal is a mathematical term for right angles. Right angles, yeah. And it's been uh, borrowed. Parallel, isn't it? No, right angles. Oh, right, right angles. angles. Okay. So it's, it's been borrowed to mean something that is in the same system but unrelated. Right. Intersecting hmm. but unrelated. It's not. It's not. Um, going to come in contact with it except at a single point. And, the, and so people talk about, oh, that issue is orthogonal to what we're doing. Like, yeah, it's kind of related, but it's not really hmm. um, it's not really having any effect. It's not really involved. Okay. Which raises, I, I think it's kind of, uh, I think it just kind of adds opacity to uh, to what you're saying. Yeah, it, makes uh, you, it makes you explore the meaning of the word. and It makes you explore yeah. the meaning of the word, but I I'm not sure that it really helps communication. Now, if for someone who doesn't know it right, 
you have to look it up and figure it out. Like us, because Kathy wrote in the notes, someone explain this to me so i had you know i think we had this discussion before <laughs> and i looked all i did was search google for twiv and orthogonal and i found it <laughs> which is really amazing actually it is. and uh it was twiv 349 we were talking about a, dis- a designer ribosome where they had altered the ribosome to do different things and they called it an orthogonal ribosome same idea even though it doesn't translate at right angles to the RNA. <laughs> it doesn't translate at right angles to the Which RNA. is what the term would suggest. But Yeah, exactly. Hmm. So it, okay, and right, I'm so excused because I wasn't on that show. You so. weren't. And Carolyn no. Bertozzi has oh. never been consulted. Uh, she was the, the one who, who did coined it. this term, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, come on, Carol. Well, at least for bio or bioorthogonal chemistry. <laughs> right. So the, these, are, uh, these are reactions that happen inside a cell but they don't react with anything else in the cell. Which kind of so, makes sense from the standpoint of this artificial amino acid, uh, you know, mm. I, I don't know. To yes. me, that when I saw that, then it made sense. So the, 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 the orthogonal system is from a archaea bacteria called Methanosarcina barkeri. And so what they found in this bacterium is a tRNA synthetase, a tRNA, and an amino acid, an, un- an unusual amino acid, which they abbreviate as, as pyrolysine. Um, the original name is very long. Mm. That will introduce a, this pyrolysine at an amber codon. And before we, we go into that, I, I looked at the article that Rich... Actually, I think it's an ochre codon. Is it ochre? Yes, it's you. It's, um, it says amber here in the text. So U- UAA. Yeah, so the integration no, of the genes... That, no, that... The UAA is for unnatural amino uh, un- acid. Unnatural oh, uh, sorry, acid. sorry, unnatural. It's so confusing. It's very confusing. Yeah, it's, yes. a, it's a very uh, unfortunate use of exactly. abbreviation yes. in the exactly. science right. paper. <laughs> no, I re- yeah, I remember noting that when I first read the paper, and that that yeah, but, bad yeah, abbreviation. Here's a cool part. So this this uh, archaea is a methanogen, produces methane, and it's present in the cow gut. Right, so it makes you know cows make a lot of methane. It's also in the soil and so forth. And when they sequenced, they were sequencing um, the enzymes involved in methane biosynthesis. The main one had a stop code on right in the middle of the open reading frame. And they're like, "What? There must be suppression going on here." And eventually, they sequenced the whole genome and found this other, this suppressor tRNA tRNA system that puts in this unusual amino acid. Fascinating. Isn't that cool? So they use that. Other people have used it to uh, to make uh, suppressor cell lines, so this is just an unusual use of it. But what I found that's really cool is that apparently, so you know, the, the tRNA synthetases are really important. They put the tr they put the amino acid and the tRNA together, right? So they have to be careful. They can't be putting <laughs> the wrong <laughs> amino acids on the wrong tRNA. So they're very sensitive. They have editing functions. But it turns out that this particular tRNA synthetase pyrolysyl tRNA synthetase is pretty loose about what it can put in. So it turns out that you can highly mutate a, a gene just by grow up, by putting it in a cell that produces this because it won't just put uh, pyrolysine in, it'll put other amino acids in uh, as yeah, well. Yeah, and you can, fe- you can feed it other weird amino acids yeah. to, deliber- to deliberately uh, pepper a, a, a protein Wonderful with word. those unusual amino acids. <laughs> Wonderful word. <laughs> Now you can imagine the the applications you could you could mark proteins in certain ways so that you could yeah. f- track them and so forth. Really, really amazing. Put a fluorescent tag in there if you want. anything you wanted. It really interesting stuff. Yeah. So they make a so, cell line. Yes, go ahead, Rich. So although they didn't specifically state this, to me the real magic of this mm. is that you stick this amino acyl tRNA synthetase and the tRNA in the cells. So now there is the potential to. Uh, uh, add this unusual amino acid uh, to the tRNA and have that plugged into a codon. But if I understand it correctly, if you don't add the weird amino acid, you're not right. going to amino acylate that tRNA exactly. and nothing happens. Exactly. And that gets around the toxicity problem. And it's a great control for all their experiments, too. Right. Yes. Because you're right. not now you're not going to be suppressing in the absence of an added unnatural weirdo amino acid and that that to me is the real trick. Yeah. Yeah, it's very wow. cool. And so this turns out to be a really neat system. They um so they make a cell line uh 
HEK 293s, human embryonic kidney, and they put in, you know, the, the tRNA synthetase, the tRNA gene, and to, to make sure they have a cell line that works well, they put in a, a GFP gene that's got a amber codon in it, right. and they, they, they uh, search until they get a green cell that's really bright, uh, and that's that's because, and that bright green is dependent on adding this weird amino acid. So it's not forever cells. amber. <laughs> <laughs> what does that come from? Uh, that was his nickname, Who? Forever Amber. Oh yeah, it's Forever right. Dixon. You remembered, Vincent. You're on. You're on the ball. Today. I'm still here. Come on. The cylinders <laughs> but, are on all, but not every day. They're cooking. No, it's okay. Well, We're all like that. So they make a cell line that now has this whole orthogonal suppressor suppressor synthesis in it. They can suppress GFP in it. They can actually grow influen- wild-type influenza virus in. It doesn't have any issue in it. So then they start introducing amber codons into the influenza virus genome. And they start with... I, I just... Yes, I, I want to make one other small side comment on the uh, methodology. They stick in not one, but 12 copies of this tRNA. Yes. Mm-hmm. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, so they're making sure, mm-hmm. driven by four different Paul three promoters. Paul right. three is right. the form of the polymerase that transcribes uh, these. And one of the things that interests me is that tRNAs are highly modified structures. Okay, so they get all sorts of work done on them after the initial synthesis that modifies bases in all sorts of uh, strange ways in order to uh, give them their final structure. And I find it remarkable that this thing taken from archaea and stuck into a eukaryotic cell is apparently appropriately modified so that it uh, functions correctly in this background. Right. I'd, I'd be interested to know whether it's actually totally uh, uh, accurately modified or what. That's an interesting problem in itself. There you go. So they are able to, so they have influenza viruses with with one or multiple um, amber codons in various genes. I mean, they start with one and then they, they increase the number. But essentially the, the procedure is to, to recover influenza virus from DNA, you take eight plasmids, you put them all together into a cell. If they are wild-type plasmids, you put it in a conventional cell, you get virus out. If you have introduced amber codons into various segments, you put it in a conventional cell, you're not going to get any virus out because there's no protein produced. But if you put it in their transgenic cell, which they call it, which has this, this orthogonal system, uh, in the presence of this unusual amino acid, the unfortunate UAA... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you get virus produced, uh, and that virus you can take, and if you infect a conventional cell, it doesn't grow, and if you infect a transgenic cell, it will only grow in the presence of UAA. And they, will, they, they measure this by, uh, by just looking at cytopathic effects, and they, they also do uh, growth curves later on. So the it actually works. Amino, the unusual amino acid is... Uh, N epsilon two azido ethyl oxycarbonyl L lysine. Right, huh. right. This is they, scary. They, they've reduced the pyro. <laughs> it's got <laughs> it's got all sorts of stuff. Um, it's amazing. That's not toxin itself. <laughs> and 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 interestingly, you have to keep in mind that they're changing codons from usually something other than lysine. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. to this and plugging in this weird amino acid. So not any codon is going to work because you're plugging in this crazy amino acid. Right. And they screen a whole bunch of different mutants. Yes. And only some of them are suppressible. And that's probably right. why. If you stick mm-hmm. this weird thing in, yep. you can't just stick it in anywhere. Yeah, some of them right. Some of them don't grow well. Some of them revert. So they, they go through quite a few of them. Um, and in the end, they pick one version with four stop codons. In, uh, in 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 genes encoding internal proteins, not surface antigens. They say we should leave them alone, you know, because we don't know what would, would happen if we use that as a vaccine. Uh, and then they start to do some mouse experiments with those. They, for example, they put the virus. So again, this is produced. It's got four stop codons in, in four uh, internal Gene, genes encoding internal proteins. They grow them up in the transgenic cells in the presence of UAA, and then they can infect mice with them. So they asked, you know, what what's the effect in mice? Does it kill them or not? And they have a mouse model where they do intranasal injection, wild-type virus, you know, uh, eight times 
10 to the 3 PFU is the LD50, the 50% lethal dose. You can kill all the mice with 10 times more than that. In contrast, they put in this engineered virus, which they call PTC4A. 10 to the 9th PFU, no body weight loss, no other health issues. The mice didn't complain. <laughs> they didn't even sneeze or sniffle. All right. And so give them a huge dose. Huge, I mean, there's right. really big dose, and they're fine. Did they, t- did they take them to the opera? They didn't take them to the opera. <laughs> they would have complained. They take, out, they take out nasal turbinates, <laughs> trachea lungs. They look for virus. Um, they get very low titers of virus, 10 to the 1 PFU per gram. Um, so this virus looks to be pretty good in terms of not hurting the mice. Um, and they, uh, and in the, uh, so looks, looks pretty good. No transmission, uh, in, um, guinea pigs and, uh, no virulence in guinea pigs or ferrets. Hey, the return of the ferrets. <laughs> yes. So these, I mean, that's kind of a quick summary, but they really look pretty good, um, there's minimal reversion, if any, and they uh, they can grow them well and they don't hurt mice. So then the question is, are they good vaccines? How's the immunogenicity? And they're comparing it with an activated flu vaccine and cold-adapted flu vaccine, which would be the flu mist that you inject, uh, that you spray into your nose. And they immunize uh, ferrets, mice, and guinea pigs with either, either of these preparations. And then they measure... Uh, antibodies in, that block hemagglutination. They they measure neutralizing antibodies, and they get really good uh, uh, induction of antibodies by this um, PTC4A vaccine. Remember, it's not replicating in the mice. Right. It's just a lot of virus that's going in. It's It <clears throat> looks like wild-type virus as far as you can see in terms of structure, right? All the proteins are correct, but... Uh, um, it's not replicating and they get a really good antibody response and a good uh, cellular response as well. Uh, humoral in the blood and mucosal. So a question here, just in general, if yep. uh, the immunogenicity of this is largely due to the capsid or the outer portion of the virus, why can't you just get bacteria to churn that part out and just well, use that as a um, vaccine? So the, that's when you do that, there are internal proteins that are important also. All right. Basically, that's the short answer. You and you know the the inactivated vaccine, which did not perform well here mm. in their tests. Mm. You know the the responses they got weren't great. Um, that's because it's disrupted, mm-hmm. and it's it's really into mm-hmm. you know the proteins, and that's probably not good. So you don't really know which combination of proteins is essential for a good vaccine, then yet, right? For influenza, well, I would say for all of them is probably best. Well, yeah, you whole, to go whole th- virus is best. <laughs> unless you wanted to go through, I mean, an, an infectious virus is best, but as we'll see, this, yeah. this might be pretty good. Okay. So then they, they do challenge experiments. They immunize these mice with the three different preparations. Three weeks later, they challenge them intranasally uh, with wild-type virus, and then they look for viruses in the lungs. Um, they get it substantial decrease of virus in, in both the cold-adapted and PTC4A groups. Uh, they're better than the <laughs> inactivated vaccine groups. Uh, and in terms of survival, and all the mice in the in the uh, control group died nine days after challenge. Uh, all the mice survived after one dose of either cold-adapted or the PTC4 vaccine. So it seems, in mice at least, it worked. In mice at least. Uh, right. And and the uh, the mice regained their body weight that they lost initially. So now this virus would be able to initiate an infection. It's a whole live virus, if you can use the term live, um, that will find its receptor and get into the cell. And yeah, you go through the early phase of infection, but then there are all these termination codons in critical proteins, so it's never going to be able to complete that life cycle. Correct. And so, yeah, so the, it, yeah, right. the, the idea, as I understand it, and what the authors seem to think is going on, is that you're getting, you're getting an immune response against this initiated infection that's going to be both the humoral and the cellular response because you had viral, repli- viral you know, activity going on in the cell, and the cell is going to respond to that and present those antigens, um, which would presumably give you a more robust response than just sticking in the antigens. 
Yeah, so maybe getting into the cell is important because then you can have an innate response to the viral proteins, the nucleic right. acids, and so forth. And you know, an inactivated right. vaccine not going to really do that very effectively. And would the be, theory behind I, flu mist, of course, is that that would be part of the process. It would get in and do, uh, in that case, repeated rounds of infection, but would be restricted to a particular area of the body. Um, but in this case, you, it could go potentially anywhere in the body. You could inject it um, and you'd get the start of an infection, but it wouldn't replicate. Now, one might ask, why is this better than flu mist, right? Yeah, one, one might. might. One might. Yes. <laughs> Two might. I think some people might. I mean, flu mist, they say in the introduction, you know, the problems with flu mist, there's a, there's a, it's hard to make it and it's not that efficacious. It doesn't right. protect very well. Uh, in fact, we've talked not too long ago about some problems with flu mist in the exactly. past season, right? Yep. So Right, I, but I just read something that said that, oh, it was in ASM Microbe it, that just came out and evidently there was a Canadian study mm. Yes. That said that it was Fine. wasn't so bad, and the difference yeah. was trivalent versus quadrivalent. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's exactly. So that's a little right. weird. That was, yeah. That's just one of the stories we discussed. Well, and previous right? data on flu mist had led the CDC to recommend it for, um, particularly for kids, um, because it was uh, it was apparently much more effective than the inactivated vaccine, especially in younger populations. And then, I guess. Either something changed or we got different data and um, came around to the view that maybe it doesn't work so well. And that could be the tetravalent that's doing that. Yeah. Actually, we uh, we had follow-up discussions to that. And I consulted with my uh, 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 buddy at uh, Metamune. And I, I think the difference mm -hmm. isn't necessarily trivalent versus quadrivalent, uh, but just a, a difficulty with one of the trials in particular. Oh, right. Uh, with uh, flu mist, uh, and there's some suspicion that maybe that batch of virus uh, particularly was exposed to a higher temperature or something like that, and they're working on resolving that. Okay. Yeah, if you look at, if you look at the data in this paper, the PTC4A and the cold adapted really performed similarly in terms of yes. antibodies and protection of mice, right? Yes. right? So we don't know if this would be better than cold adapted virus you know maybe we would have the same problems uh, who knows but it has to or know, different problems or different problems you have to go into a trial and figure it out i, I think the technology is pretty cool uh, it could be used for other vaccines as well and if they bring this through clinical trials it might prove to be a better who knows I, i'm not sure it necessarily would be that remains to be seen so a, a couple of a couple of other uh, points. There's the the reason for putting multiple mutations in is to reduce the probability of reversion. Yeah. And yes. once you get uh, once you get up to two mutations, uh, rather than just one, you get down to a reversion frequency of like less than ten to the minus eleventh or something like that, undetectable because it's really hard to reverse. So it's not too hard to revert one mutation, but reverting two, uh, much less three or four, is much more difficult. It's 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 less probable. Um, the other thing, you know, I wonder how much, how important it is that this go through the early phases of the replication cycle. I would presume it's quite important. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So to, to, to we saying before. make some of these things, right. and and so uh, I would expect. I noticed that as they were putting, uh, adding mutations into this, that they avoided putting an amber code on in the hemagglutinin. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was the la until they got to all eight segments and they added hemagglutinin. And of course, that performed the worst, uh, but uh, you don't know if that's because it's got eight mutations in it or because the hemagglutinin is uh, mutant. Sure. But I'd be very interested to see the difference between, for example, a hemagglutinin or a neuraminidase mutant uh, and some of the others. You might actually be able to get some insight into the correlates of protection by looking at uh, what antigens affect the uh, 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 effectiveness of this. Yep, I agree. And as they point out in their discussion, this is not restricted to flu. Nope, not at all. Right. I think we should make a Zika vaccine this way. Okay. Anyway, thank Somebody's you, Drake. Somebody's probably working on it. There, yeah, was, sure. there was one more thing I wanted to point out, is that they said when they did a, a co-infection of wild type and mm -hmm. the PTC virus, that they 
attenuated the wild type virus infection. And my recollection is that, that it was probably because of reassortment. They think. Yes. Yeah, they, they actually looked at that. They did some sequencing, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that was really interesting because I thought, you know, when they introduced that experiment, they said we're going to do a mixed infection. I thought, oh, no, you know, the wild type's going to rescue the mutant and that'll <laughs> uh, create a big uh, problem. And no, it's the other way around. Yep. The mutant yeah. uh, puts bad apples in that barrel and, uh, <laughs> and, and messes up the wild type. Cool. Bad apples in the barrel. That's wow. Great. Man, you're full of good ones today, <laughs> Dr. Conde. It must be that Texas pizza. That's it. It's Texas pizza. All right. So, um, thank you, Drake. That was a cool paper. I liked it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. We got Very into nice. a little Very nice. molecular really glad biology. Yeah. All right. So, Dixon, here's a question. Yeah. What's an amber codon? It's a codon which actually stops the production of the protein. Yeah, it's pretty good. Who's it named mm-hmm. after? It's named after a graduate student. Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin? Little, um, UAG? UAG. Yeah, it's the ben- University Harris, of Georgia. Harris Bernstein. <laughs> that's Harris Bernstein is what I meant. So UGA is the University of Georgia. That's, that's the right. Opal, right, Kathy? Get that. Mm-hmm. So Opal was picked because amber already existed. They were just deciding to stay with colors. Yes, they were riffing. It's, this it's this like is the, kind of stupid like because the, the first one law. wasn't yeah. well, and a color. It was the name of a person. Right, yeah. but amber can also be a color. No, no, I know that, but you know. And it. I always heard that it was because it could be a woman's name, so amber and opal, but then that doesn't work for ochre. No, no. it doesn't. It doesn't work for umber, which is the other the name That's for opal. Right. Yeah. These are earth tones, right. which is a 60s rock singing group, hmm. the earth tones. Opal. Okay. A lot of, a little email. First one is, no, first, before we do email, Dixon, what did I forget? You forgot um, to talk about Curiosity Stream. Thank you so much. Have you been watching lately, Dixon? Um, you should say yes. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do you enjoy it? I love it. Excellent. <laughs> Curiosity Stream is the world's first ad-free, which is funny, as as uh, Alan pointed out. We're doing ads so they can stay ad-free. Yes. <laughs> exactly. But Somebody on the other hand, they take the bullet. <laughs> but yeah, they're paywalled and we're not. So uh, we are not paywalled. So no. it's. No. So one way or another, you got to pay for things, and Curiosity Stream pays for it with a subscription service, and we pay for it with ads for Curiosity Stream. Look well, uh, this will be there will only be two more ads after this show. It's the end of the year, and that's it. So enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service, over fifteen hundred titles and six hundred hours of content. And let me ask the Twiv universe: Who founded it? Not you, not all of you, but the people out there. I'm just going to wait for right. them to answer right. themselves. Yeah, John Hendricks, uh, who right. f- was with Discovery Channel, but is no longer with them. But right. all that means is that you're going to get science, real science shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can watch this online. You can go to their web browser, type in curiositystream.com. You'll see it there. And uh, you can also watch it on your TV. Of course, on your TV, usually you can't type anything in, right, no, Dixon? So how do you get it? Well, you plug these little devices in that yeah. interface the Internet. Do you have one, Dixon? Little dongle. No, I have an older television set that doesn't have the option for that. I see. So you can have an Apple TV, a Roku, and, and yeah. uh, many other devices. You can get it in 196 countries worldwide. Dixon, how many countries are there in the U.S.? It's 196 that's in countries. The world, in the world, sorry. <laughs> I think that's the actual number <laughs> is of that countries. It? <laughs> it's probably a little more than that, but not too many. And what they have is science, technology, documentaries, mm. interviews, lectures. Um, they have Dixon de Pommier's favorite places. No, I'm sorry. That's Stephen Hawking's favorite places. This is a documentary where he pilots a CGI spaceship and stops at his favorite places. Digits with Derek Mueller, creator of Veritasium, which is a science channel on YouTube, very popular. And um, it features interviews. It's a three-parter with former NSA contractor Edward Snowden. I think once I called him the the NSA director. Someone pointed that out in an email. And that Hmm. was a mistake for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he wasn't a director. He was just a contractor. Also, Vint Cerf, who you may know is was involved early on in the formation of the internet and have a lot of other cool stuff. Deep time history is a a three-parter on the history of the universe. Dixon, do you know how old the universe is? It's about 13 billion years. Yeah, 14. Very good. Dixon is on a roll. (laughs) You you know, (laughs) he's been keeping a diary ever since. You haven't, (laughs) stop it. (laughs) I haven't what? I'm being nice to you. I'm complimenting you. I know you're, you're being, what? 
I'm, I'm speechless. Okay. That's all I and finally, uh, Underwater Wonders of the National Park takes you underneath the national parks. And this is the 100th anniversary year of those wonderful, wonderful parks. And they're underwater because they're behind on their mortgages now. <laughs> and let's just hope that our national parks stay preserved uh, yes, well, in their pristine mm-hmm. states. Okay, and not in formaldehyde. And not in formaldehyde. Mm-hmm. They so. also have a 4K library, the super high definition. So you can see every pore on everyone's face. Mm. Over, and it's actually fine. Over 50 hours of 4K content. Monthly and annual plans are available. They start at two ninety nine a month, which Dixon tells me even he can afford. This is true. Less than a cup of coffee because you're always... Actually, I don't see you drinking coffee anymore, Dixon. Uh, well, you know, maybe that's the reason why I'm on a roll right now. Because you're using the two ninety nine for <laughs> Curiosity Stream. Exactly. exactly. Good job. You know, check, out, check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. Completely free for the first 60 days. Now, Dixon, how can you not take advantage of that? It's completely That's free. That's exactly right. I keep asking the question myself. That's two entire <laughs> months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. You know, Dixon, this won't last beyond the end of the year. That's what you said. That's, that's it. Two more opportunities. And the and opportunities for it. two months free. That's it. It's gone. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIV. We, we really do. And we're going to miss you. I'm, gonna, yes. I'm, gonna, I'm sure I'm going to be. Plus they renew, of course. <laughs> yeah, who knows? They have the option. They do have the option. It's up to I think them. they'll take a break and we'll, I hope we'll do something else interesting. Lots right. of interesting things out there. Uh, our first email is from Juan who writes, Hi, I was listening to your discussion of the relation between the overlap in DNA sensing by C-gas and the cell division mechanisms. It just occurs to me that the overlap makes sense because at some point during division, the nucleus comes apart, and then the cellular DNA is practically in the cytoplasm. So it would make sense to have a coordinated mechanism to turn off any sensing of DNA in the cytoplasm so that when division is complete, the cells are not left with a marker of DNA invasion in the cytoplasm and turn on some antiviral response where there shouldn't be. All right, so this was back when we talked about how DNA tumor virus oncogenes, remember, they kick the cells into cell division, but they also appear to inhibit DNA sensing by sea gas. Well, that makes sense, right? Yes. Sure. What are you suggesting? But it looks yes. like it's I a like this. it's a viral way of preventing the cell. So we thought maybe this is you know prevent the the cell from making an innate response against viral DNA, but it could also be the cellular DNA as well. Yeah. Does anyone know? And I don't know the answer, but someone out there probably does, unless our august fine co-hosts no <laughs> um the, when you have mitosis is there an innate response to this dna in the cytoplasm can't be there just can't be there it just doesn't be. make any sense at all to have one huh. it does no not. you'd be you'd be inflamed all the time indeed well mm-hmm. dixon would argue that i am well <laughs> you could be the exception <laughs> i could be yeah i mean that that doesn't make any biological sense though does it it doesn't but i just want to know if anyone's looked at it but I mean, because there may be suppressors. Have, how does it work? Well, right. There may be suppressors that are at, at, at working there too. But right. I'm sure I'm sure someone knows. Just like Rob Knight uh, answered, was that so, who it was? Uh, wait a minute, just so, a minute, Dixon. Wait, hold on, hold on. Rob uh, White. Sorry, I was close. He answered our other question. I'm sure someone will. Yes, Dixon. So little bits of your DNA uh, put into a cell, your cell in culture, does that get detected? by toll-like receptors or... Oh, that's what they did in that paper. In fact, if you use a transformed cell, it's not sensed. Uh But in a untransformed cells without the oncogenes, it is sensed. So that's the answer. But I don't know during mitosis. Is DNA actually... There aren't pieces of it. ...exposed to the cytoplasm? Well, Does anyone know? Rich Condit, do you know? It's not in pieces anyway. It's not in pieces. I would assume assume so. It's not available because it's linked up with the chromatin structure. Well, right, but it's still... The the nucleus breaks down, and it's got to be uh, it's got to be accessible at some level, so right? Is there some uh, size of DNA that goes beyond these little bits that they it doesn't introduced? have to be? It doesn't have to be broken, though, Dixon. I don't think so. It's you just, think it's out there? Yeah. You think? So here's a question: Twiv universe. <laughs> if during mitosis, when the nuclear membrane breaks down, is there a sensing of DNA by the by sea gas or something equivalent? And if not, why not? Right. Yeah. We'll get mail. Dixon, good. can you take mm-hmm. uh, the next one? Sure. 
Bob writes, this stat slash PBS NewsHour article, and then he lists the article, uh, makes the problem seem imminently doable. What does the panel think? This is a cool paper. Another cool one. It's cool. It was in Nature Communications. A polyvalent inactivated rhinovirus vaccine is broadly immunogenic in rhesus macaques. So here's the, here's the problem. There are a lot of rhinovirus genotypes. Many. Hundreds. And so making a vaccine has been problematic. Right. Because it's so many serotypes, if you will. Yep. Um, and, and you may ask, well, it's a common cold. What do we need a vaccine for? But in young kids, it can be serious and sure. it can induce asthma. It can be life-threatening. So, And even, it, even in non-serious infections, it causes people to miss work. And I've seen yeah. estimates that this, this yeah, costs, billions you know, of, just the U.S. economy billions of dollars every year. So this is not yes. a trivial thing. Now, of yeah. course, if you don't want to go to work, you don't want to uh, <laughs> run over. Well, right. Vaccine. But this would be one less, uh, I mean, like one Ferris less Bueller, reason why we'd, you would have to yes. stay home. <laughs> so uh, this paper um, addresses this. They make 10, 25, and 50 valent mixtures of rhinoviruses wow. and show that putting more uh, genotypes in doesn't actually compromise immunogenicity. Hmm. Um, they do it in mice and also in uh, non-human primates. Hmm. So I asked Ann Palmenberg what she thought about this. Uh -huh. And two of her colleagues are actually on the study from University of Wisconsin. And one of them is Jim, Jim Gern, and he has been on TWIV before. She writes, um, I know Jim is very encouraged. A few years ago, it would not have been possible to propagate, much less isolate, sufficient diverse rhinovirus genotypes to make this attempt. But apparently pharma has really improved the material availability. We can now grow or more correctly know how to adapt all of the rhino seas to reasonably efficient culture too. Hmm. The idea of immunizing very young infants with such stuff still gives me the willies. But in <laughs> principle, these highly polyvalent approaches are worth exploring further. They only have to be partially protective to evoke significant symptom release. Mm -hmm. So she's the expert. And she likes it a lot, and I think it's pretty neat. So do the, I get uh, to brag now? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask about this, Kathy. <laughs> the senior <laughs> author is Marty Moore, my former doctoral wow, student. Wow, wonderful. Bingo. At, yeah. He's at Emory University. And, well done. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. He gave this, I got to hear him talk about it at uh, the Southeast Regional Virology Conference in April. And then I'm pretty sure it was in his state-of-the-art lecture as well at ASV. Hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. Alan Dove. All right. I'm taking Johnny's letter. Johnny, Johnny. Um, this is to make up from last time because I skipped over you a few times. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Johnny writes, Twiv gurus, belated Diwali greetings from Delhi. Chikungunya, young female hen by any other name. <laughs> this came in the newspaper today. Walk-in testing for chikungunya. That's chicken, like the bird, and gunia, G-U-N-I-A, sick. And only 500 rupees, or $7.50, a real bargain. And um, she sends a um, uh, an image of this this newspaper advertising your, your chicken gunia test. Um, the double humor, I am told, is that gunia in Uttar Pradesh means young girl. So a young hen, a chick or a pullet, hard to know. Or is there a reference to the life cycle of the virus or mosquito or what? <laughs> In the newspapers, there, it's, uh, there is easy to find information about mosquito-borne illnesses. The link uh, that she's got here is about Delhi's 10,000-plus cases, 8,000-plus confirmed cases of chikungunya. Reports are up outside Delhi as well with a headline about 20-year-old student, a 20-year-old student dying nine days after becoming ill on mm -hmm. October 8th in Mumbai. Um, the Hindu newspaper has an impressive science section on chikungunya with current information and updates. Mm. The good news is there's great public information and education available. The bad news, if you survive mosquito-borne infections, I'm taking a Tovaquone Proguanal 250 mix daily and using 100% DEET with 30% DEET wipes to augment, <laughs> you're automatically <laughs> advanced to the worst air quality survival challenge round. Mm. <laughs> out, out of the proverbial frying pan and into the mad, mad traffic should you survive. Mm. Not liking the options, but challenging ones for sure. Mm -hmm. One last viral public health awareness point. There was a large public poster in Gurugram, formerly Guragan, in Haryana state, warning parents to protect their children from the risk of Zika virus infection. Mm. Wish I'd been able to get a picture. It was mm. striking. 
back to Boston tonight. Dixon and Daniel, Delhi is quite a place, as you know. Yep. Happy to have visited. Yep. Namaste. Uh, Joni, your primary care pediatrician in Cambridge, reporting live and knock on wood, <laughs> still well from Delhi. Right. P.S. The 450 rupee special is the fever profile, usually $13.50, but for a limited time, only six seventy five. dollars Get yours before <laughs> prices go back up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. Dixon, Excellent. have you been to Delhi? Many times. In fact, um, he goes there for lunch every day. <laughs> That's right. No, there's no, there's two delis though. There's there's new Delhi and then there's old Delhi. And old Delhi is is a, an absolute rabbit warren of wires, telephone poles, ox driven carts, um, tuk tuks, bicycles, lots of activity. I mean, it's very exciting to be there, but very confusing if you've never been there before. And the the place that we were always trying to go to um, was this uh, fantastic place called Kareem's, which makes a grilled chicken, a whole grilled chicken that's just absolutely spectacular in terms of its flavoring and satisfaction when you sit down to eat it. And uh, to get to it, though, requires running the gambit all the way through this um, sort of a, a traffic jam in motion. And um, then you go to New Delhi, and New Delhi's got open streets and no pollution to speak of and that sort of thing. So, hey, Dixon? Yeah. I guess you liked it. We loved it. <laughs> yeah, we'd go back in a minute. But uh, there are some drawbacks, and I agree. Air pollution at certain times of the year in both places is really intense. All right. Uh, the next one is uh, – who read that, Alan? I, uh, I read Kathy, that. can you read the next one, please? Ben writes, Dear Vincent, I'm writing to you from Sydney, Australia, where it is currently perfectly sunny and 23 degrees Celsius. I'd like to thank you for your discussion of the chikungunya virus with Michael Diamond in episode 414. I contracted this virus in Tuxtla Gutierrez in southern Mexico in July 2015. There was a major epidemic of chikungunya in southern Mexico at the time, which I suspect was significantly underreported by public health officials. Michael Diamond mentioned a figure of between 1 and 2 million cases in South and Central America. Mm. Tuxtla Gutierrez has a population of around 600,000 people, and from conversations that my wife and I had with people around the city, it would seem likely that at least half of the population was infected during the epidemic. Mm. I realize this is purely anecdotal, but I just wanted to raise the potential underreporting of cases in Mexico when estimating the disease burden of this virus. Mm. On the subject of that burden, I am unfortunately among those who have gone on to develop chronic arthritic symptoms. I still have swelling in the joints of my hands and elbows. Obviously, I'm not alone in this. Even if we go with the lower estimates of numbers of infections and rates of chronic arthritis, we are still talking about tens to hundreds of thousands of people affected. I realize that the other subject of episode 414, the Zika virus, presents a pretty compelling case for research, but I also hope that this doesn't stop labs like Michael Diamond's continuing to do their important work on the chikungunya virus and that TWIV can provide us with chikungunya updates as this story unfolds. Kind regards, Ben. Yeah, I'm sure there's underreporting in many places mm -hmm. where it's very hard to reach people uh, and get samples and so forth. And I'm well, sure there's, yeah. there's, there's underreporting Probably just about everywhere for just about everything. everything. That's, true. That's probably it's true. true. But it's, true. It's, yeah. it's particularly bad in places where it's hard to get to people and where the, the public health system is funded even worse than than in uh, some of the developed world. I don't think it's ever really funded properly. But Hey, Rich, can you take the next one? Samuel writes, hello, Twivers. I have been a listener for close to two years <laughs> but have never written in before. I just listened to Twiv 414. I was so excited to hear about the chikungunya research uh, done by Michael Diamond. I spent two years from January 2013 to December 2014 in El Salvador. Later on in my time there, we were warned about chikungunya. I have many friends where I have many friends who were infected, especially those who live by the coast. I love learning more about this interesting virus and look forward to to more in the future. Thank you all for spreading microbiology knowledge in such a consistent and clear way. Uh, cheers. Here in P.S. Here in Provo, Utah, it is currently 14 degrees C with a wind speed of 6 kilometers per hour, a pretty warm fall day. Right. Doesn't sound real warm to me. <laughs> I, guess that's, I guess that's warm in Provo. It's very warm in Provo. <laughs> all right, let's do Not one. ski weather, that's for sure. Let's do one more round. Steve writes, hi, Vincent et al. I know you aren't 
all into trees. <laughs> but when someone showed me this excellent city treescape appreciation idea from New York, I immediately thought of you and your listeners' picks. What a brilliant way to draw attention to the services that city trees render us and to literally educate the man in the street in the street. New York City parks are to be congratulated on this beautiful resource. I only wish we treated our trees with such respect here in a, in my town. A map like this would be kept secret by the council <laughs> to help them plan the best way to cut them all down. Oh, dear. And that's Steve from Luton, England. And this is just amazing. Yeah, yeah, this is, really is cool. it's awesome. A, it's true. Yeah. Holy crap. This is a map of every bloody tree in New York City. That's right. And you can zoom in. And so we zoomed, uh, Tixon and I zoomed in around <laughs> our hammer building. And we have trees here that we know. You can click on it and it shows you a picture. Right. It tells you the species, how the diameter, the ID number. What the leaves look like. And, Good Lord. It's, it's amazing. I, I can't believe that they have, I it's mean, amazing. there may be more trees that they haven't put on this. Yeah, well, but, the other thing we noticed, Vincent, was that the absence of trees in certain areas, why don't we have trees in those places, right? Yeah. And so we raised those questions. Maybe the they're, they didn't do every tree, but, you know, if you zoom uh, out, they don't, just, have, they, they don't have Central Park. Yeah, well, they that's solid Central green. <laughs> they didn't, really? well, right, they didn't do the parks, I think, generally, no. which okay. makes so, sense because there are so many, many trees and they're in such a jumble yeah, in many places. Um, but the, just the depth of the data here, yeah, this amazing. is this yeah. is astonishing. It is. Truly, it is. And it's all five boroughs. I mean, they, right. wow. It's yeah. cool. So there are 247,962 trees mapped in Queens. And yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was at a meeting that Bloomberg ran for the, it was called uh, the 2020 plan. And by 2020, the city has pledged to plant a million more trees. Wow. That's a million more pictures that we had to look forward to, it looks like. And you can put your zip code in and look at your neighborhood. You know, amazing. It's beautiful. Cool. I guess this is a pick, but I just <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. I love it. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, Dixon, can you take the next one, please? I can. Sharon writes, "Dear Twiv, I've been listening to your podcast about viruses from around the world, and I would like to bring your attention to a viral outbreak of mumps at SUNY New Paltz, which is ninety miles from New York City in the beautiful Shawangunk Ridge." Many families travel here from the city to see the foliage, pick apples, and get pumpkins in the fall. There are year-round outdoor activities as well. SUNY New Paltz is in the center of the town and the, and the home of many activities. I am an alumni, but also a current part-time student studying Spanish. In October, we received an email explaining that one or two cases of possible mumps had been identified, and this was later confirmed by testing. Then that number went up to eight. As of now, there are 12 confirmed cases, many of whom were connected with the swim team, though obviously the patients have not been identified. The swim team has been forbidden to compete in any way meets for the rest of the season, and until the illness isolated into 20 students who were not vaccinated have been uh, removed from the campus, I guess it will continue that way. I am I added that myself. I am attaching below the, the official statements from the school website below so you can see the current status. My question and concerns come from the fact that all of the ill students have been properly immunized and became ill anyway. What is your expert opinion on this? Is this a case of a modified virus or immunizations wearing off? Why weren't they protected? Should people who are immunized feel safe? What do you think is happening here? How serious is the risk of contagion when mumps has a long incubation period? Thanks for taking the time to address a virus outbreak happening in my backyard. Sharon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm about to drive past you are new pulse on the way to maris to can you catch mumps thumb. just by driving no. past new pulse no no <laughs> good i think, that's I think you relief. need to inhale respiratory aer aerosols from an infected <laughs> or, or person <Coxsackie. laughs> but uh, you know we we have uga a lot on this episode we do <laughs> we the last when i did a twiv in uga one of my guests uh talked about this issue he's working on a mm -hmm. trying to improve the the mumps vaccine so apparently Two doses is not sufficient to give robust, long-lasting mm. protection. I think uh, Paul Dupre has also talked about this. Mm -hmm. So that's why immunized people are, are getting ill. Now, of course, there are always some non-immunized people, and they yeah. probably help circulate virus. But um, I think this, and in fact, in this uh, release from New Pulse, they say giving everyone a, th a third dose of uh, MMR, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, uh, would help at stopping the outbreak. Mm. Right. So I don't think it's a mutant. I don't think it's not no, it's being immunized. It's waning immunity. Waning immunity. Yeah. yeah. 
you can even get infected twice with the wild type virus. Look at that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, some time ago I commissioned a PLOS pearls from one of my, uh, ex students. Who's a mm. mumps, mumps dude at, uh, mumps dude. CDC, <laughs> this, uh, remembering mumps that right. uh, discusses this mm-hmm. problem in some detail. And it's, it's pretty readable. So it's a good pearls. Yep. Open access. Yes. Um, what else did I want to say that, uh, struck me here so dixon how did you pronounce that ridge shawangunk is that right yep is that where I people climb so. yep that's where goff used to climb it right? is it's up, the up uh, in the gunks the gunks, the gunks right it's the uh contiguous mountain range that extends over from the catskills okay. up and into the appalachians by the way if you go to if you just uh go to what is it uh outbreaknews.com or something like that You'll see their current outbreaks in the state of Washington and also in Oklahoma. Yeah, bumps. Do they tend to to outbreak in colleges mostly? Is that a new verb you made? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a common one because there are lots of kids thrown together, right? Right. Right. And colleges are good, but any situation where lots of kids are, schools, nursing, yeah. um, military yeah. barracks, because you hear about yeah. meningitis outbreaks in schools as well. Yeah. So it's... Did you read that one, Dixon? I, uh, yeah, I did. You okay, did. A- a- Alan, you're next, please. And poorly, yes. I should say. No, it was fine. <laughs> you read it beautifully. It was beautiful, Dixon. In sonorous tones. <laughs> uh, we're being nice to Dixon. Yeah, we are. You know, overtly <laughs> nice, and I'm getting yeah. a little bit uncomfortable here. Yeah, just wait. Actually, Not looking actually, forward to what's going to happen <laughs> next. <laughs> actually, I want to I want to add one little interesting thing to this mumps thing. Uh, that um, one hypothesis, so, because when the vaccine was introduced. Uh, mumps dropped to some baseline and stayed at that baseline for a while. And then more recently, there have been little spikes of outbreaks. And, uh, and the, the question arises is uh, why these uh, apparently new outbreaks over that established uh, vaccine era baseline. And one hypothesis that I find really interesting is that uh, during the uh, initial introduction of the vaccine or the uh, initial decades of using a vaccine, there was still a lot of wild type virus uh, circulating and people were getting boosted uh, unknowingly with the wild type virus. But once vaccine protection is, uh, you know, robust enough, the wild type virus might not be as prevalent. You're no longer getting that boosting effect, leaving you more susceptible. You raised an interesting question there. And of all the people who are exposed to the wild type virus, how many actually catch it? Even if they haven't been immunized, is it a... In the case of mumps, I don't know. Yeah. I wonder what the infection rate is. It's pretty high for measles. Yeah. Quite, yeah. Oh, quite yeah. Contagious. That's right. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Ian writes, hello to the qu- Twiv Clade. <laughs> I'm working through and greatly enjoying the Twiv backlog and got to 254, which was on an approach to HIV vaccination. Well, SIV in Reese's monkeys using, using CMV. It came to me that there have been a number of attempted vaccines using viruses to express various antigens in the host with the aim of these viruses continuing to express some protein over time. This has a number of problems from the safety of the vector to the presence of a non-naive population to the vector in the cohort. Has anyone considered a rather dumber engineering approach, (laughs) namely some form of implantable slow release device? Stabilization of the antigen is, of course, an obvious issue, as is making a device that would continue to release antigen for decades. Are there other issues I'm overlooking? It seems it might also help in some cases with vaccines that require a booster dose months or years later to be most effective. Ian from Scotland, where the temperature is starting to bounce off freezing at night and the trees are dropping their coat of gravel glue. (laughs) What is gravel glue? Sap, maybe? Or decaying leaves that Mm. tend to... Decaying leaves? Aggregate together. Okay. Yeah. Um. Oh, well, mm-hmm. I can think of a couple of issues with a slow release device. I, do, I don't know if people have looked at it. I'm sure it's plausible. Um, you'd have to engineer that in a way that it would be stable and, and implantable, but that's already been done for some drugs. So there's existing art there. Um, the biggest obstacle I can think of is acceptance. You know, where it's hard enough getting people to get a shot, and if you're now going to implant something in them um, that's uh, just for a vaccine, you'd have to have something that's pretty high risk for them to get vaccinated against by that mechanism. HIV might be a good case where that 
the, where that would work. Um, but then you would, you would also need to, it, this would be different from a drug release device. This would be po- probably a protein release device. So you'd have all the problems of keeping the protein stable. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, I wouldn't call it a dumber engineering approach. I would call it relying maybe more on materials engineering or physical engineering rather than genetic engineering and mm-hmm. not a bad idea. Right. Kathy. <clears throat> so we're on Frank, right? Frank. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Frank writes, Dear Vincent, note that Dr. Rich Kesson foresaw the unintended viral sterilization of men in his 2014 fiction novel, the famine of men, as well as the ultimate consequences. And he gives a link to this book, The Famine of Men. Uh, and I didn't read its synopsis or anything about it. So That's apparently about a discovery of a virus that specifically infects men and sterilizes them. Mm-hmm. Ah. Okay. And, uh, and so uh, you'll like this, Kathy. Only women can work on the virus. <laughs> ah, yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that's about as much as I got it, you know. That's mm. funny. Okay. So Rich Kesson we know was, Rich. A, was a professor here for many years. Yeah. He was on TWIV a long time ago. And I, I, this took me a surprise that he wrote this book. For, now, this, this arose out of our discussion of Zika replication in the testes of mice and the possibility that might be causing sterility mm. of men. Mm. So I looked at my email, and, and sure enough, two years ago, he had written and said, hey, I'm about to publish this book, and uh, <laughs> love if you could plug it, plug it on Twiv or your and blog. See, see what effect you had on that, by the way, Vincent. Well, I didn't. I didn't. But I just emailed him today, and I said, I, "I just one of our listeners just pointed this out. So maybe you could come yeah. on and tell yeah. us about this where you got this cool. idea. Exactly. So that might be fun, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, Kathy, do you want to take another one since that was so short? You got a Twiv sure. blog, by the way. Sure. Oops. Uh, oops. Okay. Scott yeah. writes, "Hello, Twiv team. I would like to start by saying I'm a huge fan of your podcast." I began listening around episode 350 and have been attempting to tackle the archives from both ends. (laughs) To tell a little about myself, I reside in Columbus, Georgia, where the temperature is normally miserable, but today is fairly nice with a high of 21C with few clouds. I recently graduated with an MS in biology, but my focus was nowhere near viruses. I actually did my thesis work on genetic fingerprinting in plants and building fingerprint, we call it barcode, libraries for a local flora as well as building one for the flora of Bermuda. Ooh, that must have been a tough uh, yeah, right. uh, gig. Tough, tough gig. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I won't say it was entirely thanks to your podcast that I am now employed as a microbiologist, but at least 70% is fair. Mm. I know you get lots of emails with people telling you how much they appreciate appreciate what y'all do for the virus-loving community, <laughs> but I can confidently say that you caused me to completely change the course of my academic career. Wow. I'm currently looking for PhD programs in virology. My interests are strongly pulled toward vaccinology and even more specifically towards emerging diseases. On a similar note, I do have a question for the team. Seeing as I'm going through a transitionary period, my first round of PhD applications was totally unsuccessful. Since then, I've taken this post as a microbiologist to gain experience. But is there anything else you would recommend to make up for my lack of true virology education? With the exception of a microbial diversity course and immunology course I was able to squeeze in at the end of my master's degree, I have only my work experience to teach me about microbes and only Vincent's online virology course and TWIV to teach me about about viruses. Thank you again for the wonderful podcast and for the guidance you didn't even know you were giving. (laughs) Scott. (laughs) P.S. I picked up a copy of Marilyn Rusing's virus a couple years a few days ago, and I haven't been able to put it down yet. It's amazing. Any advice for Scott? What else? Coursera be courses doing? online, I think. Yeah, well, he, he, he's taken that. In virology? Oh, I don't think yes, so. sir. You know, okay. I think being employed as a microbiologist, I think That's I think enough, yeah. ex- experience in the lab is the is the important thing, and I don't think it has to be specifically virology. Yep. Okay. Just wet bench, whatever. You know, mm-hmm. something. Something with, uh, you know, cells or microbes or something like that is probably a little better, but it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Just experience in uh, uh, in a laboratory. Uh, yeah, I agree. You know what what, what 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 you look for in an applicant is is that they know what they're getting into. All right, and and they can't not do it. Mm-hmm. They're excited about it, and yeah. he's excited about virology. So yeah, that would be good. Also. Um, he doesn't mention where he applied in his first round of PhD applications. Um, 
and and you might want to tailor those to the institutions you're applying to. I mean, mention research programs that are there that you especially would like to work in. Mm-hmm. Um, that mm-hmm. kind of thing can often be helpful. And, um, you know, have good letters of recommendation. And uh, um, I don't know to what extent admissions folks look at GRE scores or, or grades for somebody who's got work experience. But, you know, just build up every part of the resume that can be built up. But it, But definitely target the application to get people's attention specifically. Like, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by RNA viruses and would really like to work with Dr. Reckon Yellow would be a, a good entree to Columbia, uh, possibly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> not. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, but and there's probably not much you can do for GREs. And GREs are really mostly right. only predictive of first year success in graduate school. So a lot of right. places aren't using GREs much anymore. And you can't do much about your past GPA history. So yes. I think getting the research experience and, and making sure you're going to get strong letters from your research advisors is right. good. Yep. All right. Rich, can you take the last one, please? Sure. Robert writes, minor note, in this episode at about 4140 minutes in the in the TWIV crew begins discussing a paper that starts kicking around the term zochlorelle and the pronunciation of its stem zoo. In the joking, zoo gets pronounced Zoe, and who is she married to? Vincent says Franny and Zoe, and Dixon, question mark, states instead at 4325, F. Scott Fitzgerald, was married to Zoe. Incorrect. Fitzgerald. Right. Uh, was married to, uh, oh, and he says, Fitzgerald was married to Zelda. Zelda. Yeah, Nay, Zelda. So, I sorry. How come none of us picked that up when you said this? I, I should have known that. I went to college right we behind the We all knew it, and I said it wrong. That Zelda, I knew that, too. That I mean, you know, it's, in, like yeah. this, it's like listening to uh, Jeopardy at home. You went to college and you can the, get the, them all the Towson, right. The Towson State University campus um, is borders the grounds of the Shepherd, uh, Shepherd Pratt uh, uh, psychiatric hospital in Baltimore, which was where Zelda died in a, uh, in a hospital fire. Yeah. Yeah, we should anyway. have picked it up, Dixon. Yes. Uh, you know, we get a lot right watching Jeopardy at home, but I'm sure if we were on the show, we'd get them all wrong. But it's usually you that gets it wrong, Dixon. <laughs> usually. And there- the reason there's a question mark after Dixon is because he's not sure how to spell it, and he chose <laughs> the yes. city in Illinois. Spelling that's true. It. That's true. Right that's one. true. That's Dixon, true. how do you spell your name? It's um, hmm. Let me think about that. <laughs> it's actually, it's D I C K S O N. Okay, and he doesn't like to be called Dick. Right. Just uh, like I don't like to be called Vin- Vince. I don't have a preference. Yeah, you told me once. You said Vince. I prefer, I prefer. Why do you have Dick De Pommier on all the podcasts? Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Rich. Continuing. Also in this episode, Vincent (laughs) digs in on what level of proof is required for scientific deductions. Uh I'm with him. I became a scientist because of an attraction to the certainty that comes with the scientific method. Evidence evolves a view of the universe based on a current understanding grounded in experiment. That viewpoint is subject to a moment's revision when new evidence overturns current thought. Mm -hmm. Mm. Good. Quote, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, end quote, deductions do not rise to the needed level of certainty required by rigorous science. As the panel notes, this may be okay in informal discussion with modifiers as in it looks, it is looking increasingly certain that, <laughs> etc. Bob. Yep. Yes, that was mm-hmm. when Jeremy Lubin said, well, it looks like a duck and walks like a duck. So let's call it a duck. And I don't think that was the next, I didn't say anything when he said that but the next episode i said i don't really feel comfortable with that i think we need proof so thank you that's i like the way he puts that Mm -hmm. okay it is time for some picks of the week indeed alan what do you have i have a um an iphone game uh well i think it's iphone and android and uh you can do it on any of the devices that run those systems it is um a game called Superbugs, <laughs> and it's the, it won the Longitude Prize, which is a, a challenge to develop um, things along these lines. Um, so you can look into the Longitude Prize, but I'm specifically picking Superbugs because it's a, a neat idea for a, a little mobile game. It starts off and the bacteria start 
multiplying and you need to treat them and you have an antibiotic and you <laughs> deliver it. Um, but then they start developing resistance and you, it takes time to develop a new antibiotic. And so you're, you're trying to um, uh, spare your, your existing antibiotics <laughs> while the new ones come online because if you overuse them, then you're not going to be able to combat the thing. And um, I, I survived only a couple of rounds of this and I think that's rather the point. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a fun little download. Mm. That's cool. It cool. Makes, a, makes a very serious point. I really like that. It certainly does. Uh, I, I would like to play it, but We'll see. We are playing it. <laughs> yeah, we are playing yeah, it. That's good point. Right. Yes. Yeah. yes, we are all playing this game now, yeah. so now you can see what this it looks like. Real-time reality show. Rich, what do you have? Uh, I have a short little piece uh, from science, a freelance science writer named Sid Perkins, called Ancient Eclipses Show That Earth's Rotation Is Slowing, which is a write-up on an article uh, that I linked here. Hmm. That's in, let me get it, it's in the uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society A called Measurements of the Earth's Rotation, 720 B.C. to A.T. 2015. This was actually uh, written up in the newspaper this morning, but I kind of chased it down to try and find the original article and find some other write-ups, and I kind of liked this uh, Science Magazine write-up. It's been known, apparently, I didn't know this, but it's been known that the Earth's rotation has been slowing down, is slowing down for quite a while, but this uh, is an attempt to get a better handle on it, and I thought hmm. that the uh, attempt was interesting and some of the explanations were interesting. The attempt is to use historical records. I mean, we're talking clay tablets, and that kind of stuff, of uh, Egyptian of um, eclipses kept by the ancients. Now, you would think that that wouldn't necessarily be too accurate, but for any given eclipse, this guy, uh, these guys have done like 50 different cross-references from a bunch of different sources to try and pin down exactly when that eclipse happened. And they have some way of, you know, timing that and comparing it to uh, uh, what's going on uh, today. And they calculate that the... Earth's rotation is slowing down by, uh, what was it? It's about 1.8 milliseconds uh, per day mm -hmm. uh, over the course of a century. Yep. So that amounts to about, since <laughs> in the past 2,700 years, about six hours. <laughs> All right? Yeah. Um, and apparently, the main reason for this is... Uh, because of all the sloshing around because of the tides. <laughs> okay? Great. Great. <laughs> Which I find fascinating. But apparently, it ought to slow down more because of that. So there are other forces at work speeding it up. And the thing that I like the best is, uh, let me find this, because he really um, describes it nicely. Um, other factors must be at work. Get this. One major influence is the slow rebound of crust that was weighed down by massive ice sheets during the last <laughs> ice age that have since melted away. So the ice age caused the crust to kind of collapse and it's bouncing back, whereas the crust is springing upward at high latitudes, at lower latitudes, <laughs> the planet is shrinking inward. Like an ice skater bringing her arms inward to spin faster, that overall shift of mass is speeding up the Earth rotation. I love the, the is it a metaphor with the ice skater? Mm -hmm. Homeric. They're called the, Homeric the similes. Homeric similes. Uh, okay, that's wonderful. Yeah. So anyway, why, do, why does the Earth keep rotating? Is it just rotational momentum? Yeah. Angular uh, momentum. That's, that's out, how it that's formed. Out of my pay that's grade. exactly how it formed. <laughs> And why? It, is, it formed from an accretion disk, yeah, and it's called spin-up. As the amount of matter compresses towards the center, it spins up and angular momentum increases. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, centrifugal force tends to push the stuff out, so you've got a push and pull thing going on all at once. Yeah. They've got pictures of this. If you look at the Hubble, you can see examples of this throughout the universe. So in theory, would this continue forever, or there's a finite time of spinning? Yeah, well, before that happens, I think the sun will go uh, nova, and we okay. won't uh, have to worry about that part. Oh, gee, I was 
looking forward to it. <laughs> I but think that there are other six hours is a long time, though, when you consider that it's yeah, within yeah, yeah. human yeah. history. I think there's other disasters looming in the nearer future. Uh, yes, tell me, yes. About, tell me okay. about it. Okay, Dixon, what do you have? I have something that fits in really well with today's. Um, discussion of what amber actually meant (laughs) and i had not known that by the way when i picked this as my pick of the week but it's amber is a remarkable um preserver of the past it is pine tar resin basically it's clear Uh, i have a large piece of it at home that i bought in cambodia and uh, it's present in certain areas of the world including new jersey which is a very famous place for amber believe it or not the baltic states have it too and china too and so this This is a piece of amber from China, which actually captured the tail feathers of a dinosaur. I think it's from Myanmar. Yeah, Myanmar. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, this paleontologist was looking looking around at an amber market in Myanmar and found this. Yeah, well, the market was in Myanmar, but where did the actual amber come from? That is an open question. Yeah. Right. But the point is that this is indisputable proof. The dinosaurs had feathers. We know this is a dinosaur bone, yeah. for sure. Yeah, the age has got to be dinosaurs. You can date this stuff. And you can look for the plant uh, pollen and all kinds of other things in the background. They've That's got insects cool. in there as well. Yeah. And uh, it's remarkable that we have such a, a vivid, 100% um, ironclad uh, proof of concept that we Well, this is a tiny one. It would fit in your palm, they say, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. Big, about as big as a sparrow. Exactly. <laughs> An English sparrow? <laughs> yeah, we get, we're back to the sparrow work. Dear, dear, dear. But this, if you go online and look up Amber, there's a tremendous literature on this. And in fact, there's a guy by the name of George Poinar who used to be a nematologist out at uh, UC Berkeley and is a friend of mine and wrote a book called Life in Amber. And it's all about finding these ancient forms of life and uh, these clear, hmm. preserved, present, uh, preserved. It's the it's the basis for the Jurassic Park uh, trilogy. They tried to get DNA, but didn't get any. No. The um the photo showing the the amber field, the the facility yeah. where this was dug up in Myanmar, is rather yeah. depressing. Uh, well, mm-hmm. but yeah, yeah. they're cutting all the trees down. Yeah, they've uh, cut all the trees down. They're digging the strip mine to pull out the amber to sell. But anyway, it's a neat discovery. Ooh, yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. It's a beautiful little feathery thing, right? Is. That's very neat. It is. Kathy, what do you have? Well, first I was going to just pick the YouTube video. It was from the University of Michigan. We It was just put in something that we got this week or early last week. I don't know. Uh, about why lithium ion batteries explode. Mm. And I thought it was a nice, simple explanation and then there was an article in the New York Times about somebody making a better lithium ion battery and there's pictures of uh holes punctured into the batteries with screwdriver which you would never ordinarily do with a regular lithium ion battery. So for those who have just been wondering why these batteries are so explosive, I thought the two things together made a nice explanation. <laughs> That's cool. I like the video. That's cool. I heard this week that the reason the Samsung Galaxy 7 uh, catches fire is they didn't build in enough expansion space around the battery. Mm. I don't know if that's true, but it's interesting. All right. I have uh, two picks. Um, One of them is an editorial that was published last Sunday in the New York Times, which I found really good. It's called Truth and Lies in the Age of Trump. You know, it's it's... It got me thinking about science, but the whole idea is that, you know, there's this whole thing lately about fake news. And and the way the the editorial goes is, you know, at one point we got our news, we all got our news from the same place. You know, Walter Cronkite, the proverbial source. And then cable TV began to fracture that. And then with the Internet, everyone gets their own news, whatever they want, whatever they want to believe in. And they talk about how Trump has taken advantage of that and his disdain for facts and, in fact, it's not just him, but many politicians have a disdain for facts. Uh, they have this here, a quote from George Bush. One of his advisors mocked a Times reporter as living in the reality-based community. <laughs> I just, not, how dare you? It blows my mind. <laughs> you know? What a quote. <laughs> and then R- Mitt Romney's aide said, we're not going to let our campaign be run- be dictated by fact Hell checkers. No. Hell no. Right? <sighs> so... Um, one of Trump's uh, aides said, "There's no such thing, unfortunately, anymore of facts. As it should be as facts, at least right? in their um, view of things. 
<laughs> so anyway, the the um, the article concludes. How do we deal with this? We don't have Walter Cronkite, and they say, well, maybe uh, newspapers, in the absence of of politicians who care about the truth, um, media organizations that report fact without regard for partisanship, and citizens who think for themselves will need to light the way. Which I think is is kind of a sad answer because I'm not sure that's the answer to it either. Certainly not citizens or. Maybe not news organizations. There are some notable exceptions in Congress. Barbara oh, yes, of course. There are, there are exceptions, yeah. and hopefully they will prevail. Anyway, I get to be thinking about yeah. that and science, which has been – we've had science fiction for – not the, not the, the literature, but sci- fake science has been around forever. You know? course, and sure. So I wrote a blog post about my thoughts and comparing it to um, yeah. fake news, and so it really shouldn't be surprising to scientists. But I'm really depressed that people – I don't want to believe in facts because as a scientist, that's what we revel in. That's what we mm-hmm. search for. It's true. And to think that, you know, any politician has no regard for fact, this is just appalling to me. So I think mm-hmm. that in that sense, the editorial is really compelling. Mm. If you like science, it's, and unfortunately it's very sad. So I thought I would have a little lighter pick. And this is um, an article in the San Francisco examiner. Uh, just recently, Uber started, using self-driving cars in San Francisco. And they're so arrogant. They said, oh, the, the, <clears throat> the regulations don't apply to us. We can do this. Uh, really? And yeah. there's a video here of one of them going through a red light. <laughs> so, Unbelievable. Um, self-driving cars have always kind of given me the creeps. Creepy. Yes. Very creepy. Same. All right. We, have a, we had a couple of listener picks already. I think the New York City trees map. Right. And now we have one from Justin, uh, which is an interesting article. In PNAS, it's from Journal Club, highlighting recently published papers. Can transmissible vaccines have a major role in eradicating disease? <clears throat> the idea is that maybe we should make vaccines that you don't have to give to a lot of people and they'll just transmit and immunize. To which I would say... <laughs> Didn't we do this already? We do that with polio. It's, <laughs> it's not a good idea. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> so vaccine-derived polio viruses you know, are shed from people who are immunized and they spread to other people. But... They're no longer FDA regulated <laughs> vaccines. So, I unless you have a way to control uh, the genetic variability of these vaccines, I don't think that it's going to play a major role. Yeah, they do mention the um, vaccine derived poliovirus and and vaccine derived paralytic poliovirus um, in the article yeah. to their credit. But uh, I mean, of course, yeah. it could be in the future this changes. But I remember distinctly hearing Albert Sabin years ago saying, you know, when the vex- my vaccine that is excreted from people is not an FDA-approved vaccine. You know, we can't depend on that to immunize the population, although it did to a certain extent. There are studies yes. done uh, in his era that showed that in communities where um, not everyone received polio vaccine, OPV, others were immunized by its yep. passage through the community. But, immunization. but at the same time, the virus was re- reverted and yeah, you were virulent, so not a good idea. But uh, that was also, I mean, that was excusable at the time because that was the technology at the time. And to do this, to do this as a design goal, I think raises a serious ethical problem. I think because you're, yes, I mean, you're, you're saying at the outset that we are going to deliver a vaccine that will reach people without informed consent. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's a big problem. We have enough trouble getting everyone to take vaccines. Right. As it is to think that people would be getting it without, yes, as you say, their consent. I don't think that would be acceptable. Yeah. All right. This is a lot of fun, isn't it? That's good. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is TWIV. This has been 420. You can find it at iTunes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. By the way, there at the website, you find all the show notes and letters and other stuff. Uh, But you can, of course, just listen on your phone. There are lots of apps that you can use to grab the shows. And we love getting your questions and comments. Please send them to twiv at microbe.tv and consider supporting our work. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have lots of ways that uh, you can give. And one of them, of course, is Patreon. You can give as little as $1 a month. And uh, if you do that, you know, there are, award, there are rewards for different support levels. And a buck a month gets your questions to the top of the queue. So check that out. You don't have to do it. No problem, but if you'd like to thank us and enable us to go to uh, Hoboken Pizzeria in exactly. Austin and do a TWIV from I, exactly. there, 
This is or, what it's or for. Or Austin Pizza in Hoboken. I'm waiting for them to open up one of those. Why don't you do that, Dixon? You know what? I think you should do it because there's a signature no, I, to I nature. Am, I am not a restaurateur. No way. <laughs> Nor I. No, no, no way. I'm a restaurant goer. Dixon de Palmier is at thelivingriver.org and, uh, wait a minute, um, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. This was good. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And the good news is the storm hasn't started yet. Right. Get home safe. Yeah. I have to get back from Poughkeepsie before it starts. Mm. And there's going to be a lot of traffic tonight, but that's life, right? I'll just listen to podcasts. You do that. (laughs) Rich Rich Condit is formerly at the University of uh, Florida in Gainesville, and he's still an emeritus professor at the moment. He's in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. This is great, great fun. I really enjoy it. Good. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.